Oh my giddy aunt, it's Happy Times and Places, a positively inclined Doctor Who episode commentary podcast in which I, Toby Haydoke, ask a friend to choose a story and nominate their favourite things about each episode. I watch, commentate along and try to guess what those favourite things are. Hello Toby, it's me, David J Howe here. Now you may know me as a writer, as a researcher, as a publisher of all things connected with Doctor Who. Um, but today I'm here to talk to you about one of my favourite stories, and it's The Mind Robber. Welcome back to Happy Times and Places, but I'm going to remove you from the ordinary universe of podcasts and displace you from reality into one of the total fantasy that is The Mind Robber, where uh, I, my special guest is the entirely fictional David J. Howe. He only exists as the name on the spines of books like uh, Doctor Who's uh, handbooks and the 60s, 70s, 80s that he wrote with uh, Mark Stammers and Stephen James Walker and were uh, books that took great strides in Doctor Who research and its presentation. Uh, and uh, he, of course, runs Telos Publishing as well. Uh, oh, and not to mention the, the Target book, which I think is... Uh, you know, uh, 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 was a well overdue study of uh, those really important aspects of Doctor Who's history. So, you know, David's been there leading the way. Also a very nice chap uh, who I always enjoy uh, meeting when I go. It's the only times I think I've ever properly hung out with David is, it, uh, is, is when we've been guests at conventions. But uh, he always, he's always seems very pleased to see me and his wife Sam is very lovely. And um, so and uh, I, I very much enjoy their company. Uh, so I was delighted when David uh, lent his name to this podcast, which he did. I mean, he, he recorded this stuff on video, which you went to great effort to do, and you're only getting the audio because I'm doing these uh, as podcasts just at the moment, because at the time of recording, I'm also writing a book about Quatermass, and I'm trying to write some spec scripts, and uh, I've, you know, got a, 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 a not 100% a healthy partner at home, and I've got to walk the dog, and I've got a whole list of things to do in the house. So something had to go, and it was my YouTube videos. But uh, hopefully this podcast is enough to get the measure of David, who is a Doctor Who fan of, you know, I was going to say of old, but that's, that's, that's you know, age, age is not a thing to, to label anybody with these days because it makes us all feel like we're getting a bit over the hill, says he with a frozen shoulder. Um, so of your a Doctor Who fan, a, 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 a Doctor Who fan of great vintage, steeped in the history of the show, rich with the tannins of uh, 405 line uh, broadcasts um, and, uh, you know, was there at the time and is a big fan, as he said, of this very unusual Doctor Who story, The Mind Rubber. There is not really one quite like it. I, and I, you know, uh, I love the new series of Doctor Who, but it's it's rare that it goes as bold as this. I don't know if, uh, if anyone would quite forgive Doctor Who in this prosaic day and age that we have i mean i suppose the frog on the chair was a was a pretty brave attempt to do something abstract and strange but you know a lot of people kicked back on that and went oh this is ridiculous i mean doctor who is ridiculous but i suppose the um you know the key to most successful doctor who is actually for it to sort of hide its ridiculousness or play its ridiculousness totally seriously uh, and sort of try and kid you that what you're watching albeit it's about somebody who travels through space and time in a police box that's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, uh, is not ridiculous. Whereas, uh, you know, the, 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 it's, it's a rare story that goes, come on, let's embrace the fact that this is a bit way out there and, uh, and presented in such a way. Although this story is actually presented, it's presented in quite a prosaic way, isn't it? And I remember... Um, in, if you recall last episode when I was working at a at a health food cafe, um, you know my bosses who were quite open to you know old Doctor Who etc. You know found that found this a bit too straightforward. You know the when is a door not a door and all of that found it a bit too a straightforward a uh, a presentation of you know what could be a potentially really crazy idea. Whereas other people that walked in on me when I watched this, um, as I was always hoping people would. Uh, and, and become converted to the ways of Doctor Who, as we will discover as I talk through this, um, you know, found it quite beguiling and strange, which I, which is definitely what they're aiming for. There's, there's abstract ideas here. 
And I remember reading about this in the Doctor Who magazine uh, uh, episode guide. And, you know, the, the idea of Jamie and Zoe being sort of shut into the pages of the book as they are in a, in a, at the end of a few episodes time. You know, I was like, this is really strange. This is not like a Doctor Who story that I was brought up to think of Doctor Who stories being. And I think it still does exist largely in a, in a, on a sort of little peninsula all of its own. So um, let's see what happens when we get to episode two of The Mind Robber, which I am going to start watching in three, two, one. So it's... Um, this is where the story starts proper really what we watched last week was a prologue a very effective prologue beautiful prologue um and there are some episode ones that are that that i, I i'm usually quite impatient with episode ones I'm, I'm quite keen for the story to get going but uh i think i think you know especially especially now that i know a story and i you know i i i don't need any mystery really uh when i watch doc two story because i kind of know what's going to happen so it's it's more that the other things that uh you know that i that i tune in to watch but actually it's such an exercise in in mood and beguilement episode one that uh, uh that it stands on its own as a as a as a masterpiece of doc two and look at that wonderful shot of uh of of Jamie and Zoe on the TARDIS, and it's a slight re-edit, isn't it? Um, oh, she looked like she was yawning. Then it's a it's a, it's a slight re-edit, and and uh, of of uh, of of that that brilliant episode. But it's still a it's still an amazing sequence, so, isn't it? Great, you know that they're sort of stuck on the TARDIS console, and it's spinning around. I think it's uh, and 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 you know Troughton, you know uh, eyes closed. What's happened to the Doctor? Uh, you know, some is he shutting out some some force, and he's ha you know it's quite desperate because he's having to sort of summon all his power to you know to look after himself, and and they've had to sort of disappear into the void. But then it goes from that sort of strange uh, weirdness into this you know quite you know clumpy clumpy uh, sort of fairly wooden set, um, but that is actually a thing of great genius and uh, the designer is Ivan Hercules which I think is a wonderful name I think he was an Australian he is on the uh, oh this is Philip Ryan here as the red coat gets a credit doesn't have any lines he was also one of the primords in uh, in uh, in Inferno um, but again what I love about this I think is uh, is again something has had to happen because of a production issue and the production issue is that Fraser Hines has got chicken pox so actually that first bit we saw is recorded next week isn't it um and they've had to go um right Fraser Hines is off for a week what do we do uh thank goodness he got chicken pox during a story uh, set in a world of absolute weirdness and I love this design of uh uh, you know, it, it is it is all a bit fairy tale. It deliberately is sort of aping those picture books that we had when we were a child. So those massive doors with the creek. It's all, you know, Doctor Who is at its best when it when it takes the familiar, particularly from childhood, uh, and has it sort of writ large. And, and Evan Hercules's design does that um and he's got an earring and he's quite australian in the and then not long after uh, you know, it was a little death notice for him in the in the guardian uh, but he's but he's interviewed on the making of for this where he didn't seem to be particularly old either but uh, and i think he moved to itv not long after this but uh, yeah it's his it's his sole doctor who uh, here we have the confusing thing of a character being called the master uh, and we don't see his face, but it's not your actual master. But um, yes, but uh, and this is this is typical sort of Doctor Who fair. This is this is for those that are after a sort of sci-fi kind of thing. You know, the cowled figure, the the sort of possessed older geezer, um, uh, you know, with black leather gloves. Um, well, that's what that certainly looks like, isn't it? Because actually, I think later on he's just got little wooden mitt, uh, fingerless mitts, which are m much more charming. But uh, that's 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 you know that's more sort of in in the Doctor Who stratosphere, if you like. Whereas whereas all the stuff that's going on here is is still in the sort of strange fairy talesville, uh, 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 and especially the fact that Jamie has lost 
It, well, Jamie has been turned into a cardboard cutout. I mean, you'd get that sort of Jamie in the shops nowadays. Somebody did get me a Matt Smith like that, and I've had a David Tennant, but they're things that I've had to give away because uh, I was moving about, and uh, uh, I sort of wish I'd kept them now. But I do have a I do have a two dimensional Dalek that my kids gave me. It's one of the fat backed Daleks, but you can't see it's fat back when it's only two dimensional. Um, uh, maybe and maybe it's their attempt to turn it into a piece of fiction to mean that those 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 fat multi coloured M and M Daleks, Swiss Army Daleks, never existed because it's a two dimensional version. But uh, my son's got me for Christmas and is looming at me, and it's actually quite effective as a cardboard cutout. Um, but yes, but Jamie uh, Trout is very that's very good at Trout and getting confused between the the, the, the two shouting at him. Uh, and I like that sort of childish, sort of petulant. I can't cope with this. Um, uh, nowadays, you'd say he's 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 he's, he's struggling to process. Uh, the, I'm a bit like that. I don't like it when more than one person is talking to me, and 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 uh, or or somebody's trying to instruct me to do something when I'm concentrating on something else. I I very much uh, uh, identify with the doctor there. But yes, Jamie is a two-dimensional cardboard cutout. Um, that's great, isn't it? That's a bit truman show isn't he when he, he says about the light and then and it's pretty obvious the studio lights sort of come on uh it's you know it's slightly meta it's slightly this is really ambitious for doctor who which tends to tell stories about aliens invading a base do you know what i mean or nice peaceful uh, aliens on an alien planet getting invaded by nasty alien monsters uh you know this is this is something quite different and i'd seen pictures of these uh of these toy soldiers and thought they looked pretty good in the pictures but uh I, you know i'm i'm well used to pictures that look great in doctor who magazine uh not being so great when uh, when confronted with the actuality and actually i think the noise that the soldiers make their clunky gait the design of them they're a thing of genius they're a childhood clockwork toy uh you know writ large uh and again the sound really helps they have that really uh slightly disconcerting sound and we've only seen their feet so far as well so that's nice direction from uh from from david maloney but yes uh, jamie is a cardboard cutout uh we still haven't we still haven't got back to him uh and now we have oh that's brilliant <laughs> The subtitle said Lilliputian and then speaks Brobdagnagian. Oh, well done, subtitles person who is uh, obvious, who's obviously uh, done your research into uh, Lemuel Gulliver because I wouldn't have known which was Lilliputian, which was Brobdagnagian. But I remember being so impressed when I read about them the, the, when I, in the archive of, of Doctor Who magazine that... Uh, all of Gulliver's lines were actually lines from the book. Uh, a, a little bit later, um, there was an article, uh, you know, when the, the uh, uh, examinations got uh, a bit more detailed. Uh, maybe it was an interview with Peter Ling, actually, that said that all the lines were his actual lines, that, that some of the lines are, you know, half measures or they're messed about with slightly or whatever. But, that, you know, you'd only know that if you if you went and studied the text in great detail and compared and contrasted and not many of us are going to do that and yes i'm sort of glad somebody did for the sake of an article but i think i think there's enough enough effort has gone in to make um you know gulliver's speech so it means that the, the speech is slightly disjointed the communication is slightly disjointed because he's he's obliged to answer in a particular way and that kind of comes across that disjointedness in 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 the conversation that these two have because he's using lines he, he the only thing gulliver can say is stuff that gulliver says in the book that is again that is a such a brilliant use of the idea a bit like officer crabtree and hello hello where they've gone well you know people in uh uh, dramas of this kind they speak in the accent of the country they're from if uh, in in order to you know su suggest um, that they're speaking in a foreign language but therefore if somebody is speaking that foreign language badly the accent will and pronunciation will be wayward that is such a genius idea within the context of the world they've created in Aloha one of the best ideas ever and I love Officer Crabtree um, uh, and the same as this where they've gone we have uh, a land of fiction so let's have a fictional character let's have gulliver being all strange and i love the fact he's billed as a stranger not stranger not the stranger but 
a stranger just to give it a literary uh, a little echo of, of you know of like a, a list of dramatis personae uh, it just makes it a little bit more fictional I like I love a little touch like that I think you only ever get it one other time in Doctor Who and that's when Pat Gorman is uh, is credited as a medic in uh, The Invisible Enemy which seems strange and archaic by then but I'll still take it because I like it um uh, but yes, yeah, so so I love Gulliver. I love the idea of going, we've got these fictional characters and let's go to a little effort with it and, and, and make him speak only in his lines, which makes for the, for that discourse between the two of them to be slightly strange and therefore slightly, even though he's a benign character, there is something slightly threatening about the fact that he, he's slightly offbeat, you know, in terms of the way that he communicates. And now we've got these kids, which is very interesting. And a few of them have turned up. I think one of them turns up as a Sonta- as a Sontaran in the uh, in, uh, in 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 the Sontaran's return story in 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 Modern Who as a as a as a non speaking uh, extra, uh, you know, non speaking Sontaran extra because I think he's not not huge in stature. And I love all of this because you have to, you know, we used to stuff like this always being done in real time. Uh, so it's you know to actually see the the sword di- disappear and I don't know if it was a cut but uh, it certainly doesn't look like it uh, so it's 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 done effectively enough and there's a lot of little sort of visual and technical tricks that are done uh, very effectively uh, in this um, to to suggest that you know it is a land where the normal physical rules don't quite apply and and that again. Whereas the threat often in Doctor Who comes from a gun or a sword or a you know a piece of jeopardy, the threat here comes from the fact that you can throw a sword in the air and it comes down as a book, and you go, that's not a threatening moment per se, but it is saying that the laws of um, normality have been transmogrified into a world where anything can happen, and you know books books are. You know, you, you know, when you read a book, you conjure sometimes impossible images because that's what words can do. That's why words are so effective. But we're watching that on television. So on television, we're used to being much more literal and, and only dealing with what, you know, what what you can see. In, and, 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 and with Doctor Who, with it being, you know, quite a science based program, you know, that, that that any occurrences, even if they're sort of space age and slightly crazy, have a sort of scientific rigor on it or an attempt at scientific reality about them uh, you know it's not a magic show doctor who and suddenly we find ourselves in a world where those rules don't apply anymore and i think that's really refreshing and really interesting but it's also got this rather sort of quaint we've got riddles you know riddle me re and uh, jamie is safe and well and it shows the doctor using his imagination and there's a lot of quick cutting here which, which, you know, for something where we're used to continuous recording, we've got things appearing and disappearing uh, and, and suddenly changing off camera and then we cut and then they, you know, and, and it's, that's, you know, it's, it's again, it's David Maloney not being too self-conscious in his, his trickery. He's just sort of allowing it to happen. But then it's, you know, it surprises you when it does. Um, and this is wonderful because it, it, this to me is a sort of pre-echo of that, that lovely uh, stuff in the Crotons where he keeps getting everything wrong. I like the fact that, that Troughton, you know, is, 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 is slightly sort of flawed. And yeah, there we go. Oh, no, he's got it wrong. But it's too late. We've got the wrong Jamie. And here is Hamish Wilson, uh, who I had the pleasure of interviewing over the phone for Who's Round. I then met him later at a convention. Uh, and he, it's interesting, he never... He never sent back pictures if you sent them to be signed. So I thought maybe he doesn't like signing things. But uh, And a few people said, if you ever meet him, can you get him to sign pictures for me? And I asked him to sign some stuff at a convention. He was like, yeah, absolutely. And he signed some stuff for my friends. And I thought, well, I've asked him for three now, so I can't really ask him to sign my book. And he, he was giving no signal that he didn't want to. Um, but I didn't ask him to sign my thing because I thought, I'm sure I'll see him again. And so I never got Hamish Wilson's autograph for myself, but I did get it for other people. Uh, but interesting, he was very lovely over the phone and very lovely in person, but he never sent photos back that he'd been signed in the post, in my experience and experience of other friends of mine. It's funny how we all have our things or our lines that we draw, isn't it? Um, uh, but I really like his Jamie. Uh, I, th- I, th- I mean, he's, he's, he's got a different accent and different voice to Fraser Hines, but I think he plays the... And again, he's been shipped in at the last minute. And I think it's a really nice addition to Who Law that we have a kind of an alternative take on Jamie for a week because of Fraser Hines's um, 
chicken pox. And I love the fact that the show, uh, uh, you know, at the last minute can go, OK, well, let's bung that in the script. And as I, as I think I started saying and interrupted myself, isn't it great that that didn't happen when he was, you know, fighting a seaweed monster on a on a on a on a gas base or, you know, um, uh, you know, h- hiding in the sewers for the Cybermen, because what would you have done? They'd have written him out in some other way, uh, in the way that they write people out when they're on, they're on holiday. But at least they can plan the holidays here. This is this is something that, you know, happened during the production and they have to produce something out of necessity. I love that. I love that's the whole story of making television. That's the whole story of creativity. That's why I like doing live stage work, because because actually when things go wrong, you know, that's when the magic is produced. And I do think it is, is a, it is a kind of magic. I think creativity is magical um, uh, and, 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 you know, disaster and... and um, adversity create situations that would otherwise never occur so then the solutions to them are so special to that moment and to that occasion and to that confluence of people and ideas uh, and it creates it creates something and creativity is great um and the fact that we know the story behind all of this stuff gives us an extra into it uh, that actually helps us a little bit more than if we were just viewers at the time for whom this is a perfectly organic part of the story, it seems. It's part of this strange, weird, abstract world. I, lo- I love it when when the Doctor has to admit to Zoe that he's made a foul up of something uh, because he doesn't like her being right all the time. But the, but the beauty is she quite often is. <laughs> I love that gag. I love the Doctor being a little bit vulnerable. I love the dynamic that he has uh, with her... Um, I, and I really do like uh, Hamish Wilson's performances, Jamie. He went on to be a fine radio producer. He died of COVID, sadly. I uh, wrote his uh, his obituary for the for the for the Herald in Scotland. Pleased to do so. Um, uh, but he was a, he was when I sort of encountered him. He was a bald, bearded man. But he was a highly regarded uh, radio producer, pioneering radio producer who did, who produced hours and hours and hours of radio. Um, but here he was as a young actor in, uh, you know, in, in, in London, suddenly, you know, do we know any Scotsman? He was doing a day job at the time. This is the bit where my sister's boyfriend at the time, who was a hippie called Rots, R-O-T-S, Rots, his real name was Stephen, I think. But he was uh, uh, and, and a lot of my sisters and brother's friends would, you know, be a bit snooty about Doctor Who. It was a time when it was quite cool to be sort of, oh, Doctor Who's rubbish. You know, I liked it as a kid, but actually it's rubbish now. I remember Rots walking in and going, wow, man. And he really was a sort of stereotypical hippie. He was a lovely, gentle fellow who was, you know, curious and interesting. He's, he's, he's uh, I, th- I think they're still in touch. He's a, uh, I've probably got him, I think he's a dad of about a million now. No, I think he's got a few kids and he's a, he's a, he's a lovely guy, motorcyclist. Um, but he, um, I remember him kind of go, wow, man, a forest of words. That's, that's, that's a really cool idea. And I love the fact that, uh, you know, he was totally taken with that. And I do think the fact that these funny trees that look like a sort of Doctor Who set, suddenly you go, oh, no, there, I've got a, because I've got a different perspective on them because we've climbed up and shot them from the top. I know it's a model. And suddenly they're in a forest of words. I think that if, if, in, if, 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 if you want to know why Doctor Who is a brilliant show, the fact that its protagonists can get caught, can get lost in a jungle where the trees are the letters of a book and it's a forest of words. I mean, isn't that just a magnificent idea? I think it really is. I think it's a hugely imaginative idea. And, you know, we're watching people of a fiction caught up in an actual environment of fiction. I mean, this is before... You know, you'd 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 ever apply, apply meta to anything, or even even maybe aspire to that. They were just trying to do a Doctor Who story that was, and and they and maybe they were unfamiliar with Doctor Who, or maybe they just wanted to to change the shake it up a little bit. But for whatever, it's it's an idea that's so utterly Doctor Who, a forest of words, and yet so utterly unlike any anything in Doctor Who almost before or since. Um, and and I love uh, I love the way that uh, uh, even though he's a fictional character, and there's a lovely gentleness here to Bernard Horsfall in the first of his many Doctor Who's, um, is that is that Gulliver, despite being a fictional character, um, is is brave and will sort of stand guard while they hide. But of course, I think he doesn't see them, does he? Um, yeah. So uh, he gives them away, but not because he's 
uh, a malignant presence. He gives them away because uh, he does not see them. Uh, and this is uh, this is a nice differential kind of set. It's got the sort of metal gantries and it's got the it's got the TV monitor screens and uh, and and it has a slightly different texture to the rest of it. So uh, congratulations, Ivan Hercules. I think he's done a a magnificent job. Um, sort of bringing this world together but also differentiating between the different threatening uh, environments uh, within it um, and I love the way that the Doctor doesn't really blame uh, Gulliver there I think that's nice and what a reveal it's got a, it's got a, it's got a key on its back and it's a toy soldier and they move like toy soldiers I think that's a magnificent design taking something from a childhood toy box and making it a threat and it's yeah it's a terrific design it's augmented by the noise um one of those toy soldiers was my agent for a while <laughs> richard Iris arison uh <laughs> i was quite pleased when he became my agent because he'd been in doctor who um but you know you get over that eventually and have to go i, ca I can't just stick with somebody because they were in doctor who once um uh and here we have the callback to Jamie's dream in episode one uh, and we have another uh, uh, expedient born out of disaster is that they got a unicorn that was the wrong color so they had to paint the poor horse in blanco didn't they uh, and again this is such a simple thing it's a horse that they've had to paint uh, it's 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 the, it's the doctor and his companions on a completely blank set on a shiny studio floor with a bit of film of a horse that they've had to do things to at the last minute. Uh, and all those things have been combined together uh, to, to make the, the cliffhanger. Um, Fraser Hines and Hamish Wilson, love it. Uh, and uh, yes, I mean, this, this is the beginning, a stranger, look at that. This is the beginning of the slightly repetitive um it's Christopher Reynolds, I think, who's the who's the one that uh, who's the who's the child that turns up in uh, the 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 Sontar and Stratagem two parter. Um, it's 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 one of a run of um, cliffhangers. This isn't it, where you know the Doctor's going, no, don't run, and we're thinking, why not? And it's because you get to say, I don't believe it. It's a fictional thing, and um, unfortunately, I fear that's where you know my. my my bosses at my cafe started to, I think, find the story a little bit repetitive um, because they mix up the threats. But, you know, the the solution to them is the same. Uh, will I forgive that on this watch? Let us see. Um, but I have been asked to be, uh, you know, acknowledge through the positivity, acknowledging some potential shortcomings. So that's one I an anticipate. But for now, again, I thought that was another phenomenal episode of Doctor Who because, you know, vive la différence and it's and it's game attempt to do something with this format of a show where you can travel through space and time in a police box that's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside and go, OK, well, you know, alien monsters, you know, it's still it's sort of cowboys and Indians in a way, isn't it? It's uh, it's roundheads and cavaliers. It's, it's you know, it's one armed threat against another armed defender um and depending on whose side you're on the, there are goodies and baddies um and w when it's monsters in doctor who you can you can add a design element that makes them uniquely scary and memorable for kids but you know the template uh, is is often very very similar uh and th th this has gone no i'm going to completely shake that up and in fact the monster here is a, is a toy soldier and that there's such a good design uh i'm talking about the design a lot so well done, Evan Hercules. Um, I love the forest of words idea. I think that's a beautiful thing. So I think going into this, I think I was going to go, you know, I, I, I love Hamish Wilson because I like his performance. I think he's a really likable and cheery uh, take on Jamie. And he doesn't try to do a uh, an impression of Fraser Hines and I don't think that matters I think he's very much his own Jamie and I like that and I like that as a as a contrast to the Jamie that we know and love and I love that it was born out of necessity it was born out of disaster and I love it when Doctor Who comes up with a uh, an inventive t solution and again thank god it happened in a story that was about you know reality being you know bent into the abstract um but I love the fact that that exists as a thing that happened for that particular week of Doctor Who. And it gives a little bit of 
a, a, you know, a, a little little bit of notoriety for for Hamish Wilson, who went on to have a different career, to, you know, wonderful career in radio. But but you know, he's he's got that one off thing as he's the guy that played the different version of a Doctor Who regular for that one week, although it ends up being two episodes because of the way that they that they structured it um, and shot it in blah de blah. Um, but I think that's a marvellous, wonderful thing. And I love that they get him in on the DVD commentary too. Uh, and he was a nice chap. Um, wish I'd got his autograph. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, see, I'm, I am a bit, I'm quite shy. Um, uh, and so listen, uh, and, and annoyingly, because as I say, he was giving no indication that he didn't want to sign it but because he'd not sent the pictures back. And, and as I say, I discovered later, loads of people said, no, we sent him pictures and he never sent them back. But he was quite happy to sign in person. As I say, people, we all have our things. But he was showing no sign of getting bored of signing autographs. But I got... So I hope my friends Ben and Lee and Stephen are very happy because uh, they've got Hamish Wilson's autograph and I haven't. Um, anyway, why do I obsess on things? I'm so sorry. Um, uh, I, and I'd probably completely forgotten about that. But now here's a reminder and all my regret. And it will start to see a domino effect now of, of other related regrets I have in my life. And I will end up curled up in a ball, berating myself for things that happened in the past that I now have no power to change. Oh, we're a we're a we're a mixture of funny old things rattling around our b- badly uh, circuited synapses, aren't we? Anyway, um, so I was going to choose. Jamie, but I'm so love that forest of words, and I so love that memory of of Rot's coming and go, wow, man, that's such a great idea. I, I I really do like Evan Hercules's design from the sort of fairy tale door to the forest of words to the then, you know, what 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 they do when they've actually got pretty much nothing, you know, in a, an airfield and a horse and uh, and our regulars in a corner of the studio. Um, I love Gulliver, and I love that idea of him only speaking his own lines but i think from watching it this time bearing in mind of course that i'm also talking through it so my experience is not the same as when i just sit and watch it and and soak it up Uh, you know i miss so much when i'm talking because i'm having to you know broadcast and uh, convey thoughts and observations and enthusiasms and sometimes (laughs) regrets about not having a scribble on a bit of paper um but i i i think i have to I think I have to go where I'm being pulled, to the forest of words. I think the idea of a forest made up of letters of a book is just so brilliant. It ties in with this story. It is it is an it is an embodiment of why this story is so unique. It is something so utterly Doctor Who and yet so unusual for Doctor Who. It allows for a clever design. It allows for a little bit of a meta interpretation it allows for you know a sudden change in perspective completely altering your view of the world that you are in it allows for the idea that creativity um and literature can you know can provide um you know mystery and strangeness and again itself a sort of change in perspective so you could be a bit sort of wanky about it if you like but it's also a fun idea it's also an idea that that you know having had them sort of run around in that set and then jamie get up and look and you go oh okay yeah cool i can see that now so it's an enjoyable revelation as a viewer as well but i just think it's such a brilliant idea to have gone okay this land of fiction which is a strange idea that doesn't necessarily hold for much drama once you've gone okay this is where everybody who's fictional lives which let's think about it is a real mind screw of an idea uh it's it, but but to then get you know you then have to get drama out of it and jeopardy out of it which is probably the story's you know least successful element because of the repetitive elements that, that i've talked about that they haven't happened yet um but uh, to, but but to so to say okay we're now in a land of fiction what kind of things are we going to have here yeah we're going to have a fairy tale door yeah we're going to have a riddle um uh which isn't necessarily part of you know the fictional lexicon if you like but it's it's it it evokes those books that you know things that we read as kids and folk tales and blah blah, blah that 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 is obviously stuck in there in order to 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 help with the changing Jamie's face bit I mean the changing Jamie's face bit is wonderful and Troughton's reaction and Troughton's guilt uh, <laughs> and all of that oh well we haven't had that yet have we we have the thing um with with Zoe asking him um but 
she only realizes he made a foul up of it next week that's right uh so another of the consequences of talking all the way through it you don't necessarily pick up exactly what's what's being said but yes that that makes for that wonderful dynamic next week um so yeah, so the changing of Jamie's face is a, is a delightful thing because it has the flaws of the second Doctor. It's it's just a brilliant idea. And that, that faceless cardboard cutout, Jamie, you know, that's our Jamie who we know and love. And he's suddenly two-dimensional. Ha ha. I mean, that, you know, uh, you know he's a two-dimensional cardboard cutout, which, you know, fictional characters can sometimes be. Um, but, but to see him reduced to that and with his face removed is a really upsetting image as well. But it's also strange and, and, and unsettling and weird and, and again works on a number of levels. Oh, it's so clever. Um, and I, again, I think I might be imposing some of this upon it. I'm not necessarily sure that a, a lot of this was the author's intention, but that doesn't matter as, as our storytelling and, uh, and, and our um, analysis uh, gets gets you know digs deeper than perhaps anyone originally intended i think it's legitimate to sort of go well you know this can work on that level even if that was was not the intent but it was certainly uh, an attempt to look at um you know how how we deal with fiction and and uh and 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 you know how how we we take fiction to be real and what that consequences of that might mean it's born out of a society that was you know that was getting attuned to even if incorrectly you know the uh, um what what was what was what was coming out of t t television screens and and how that impacted on society and the blurring of reality and fiction and what that what that does to us i mean it's you know it's a it's a fascinating concept and it's a brilliant idea and as i say not, not they don't necessarily explore a lot of that um uh, you know act literally within the drama but it opens up those sorts of thoughts and possibilities and that i think makes it really intriguing uh, so well done peter ling and, and and part of that is the idea of creating this forest of words so the environment itself um you know is an is an embodiment of the idea of the fiction within which our fictional ha -ha, characters find themselves how brilliant so yes despite the face changing thing which i think is probably what david will choose but despite the excellence of hamish wilson despite the fact that it was a it, it was a last minute resort to uh cover the illness of a member of the cast and an ingenious one at that that was fortunate enough to be set in a story where you could do something like that oh so you know all of that stuff which again you know that's us knowing the facts of this fiction oh and the fact of fiction what a better title than the mind robber i'm glad that it's been used in doc 2 magazine for its series of articles but the fact of fiction is a beautiful one of the beautiful uh, titles we never got but should have had uh well, we did eventually get the hungry earth but that was uh that was one for frontios wasn't it uh, that's a better title than frontios the day that god went mad uh, uh would have i think made the face of evil seem slightly stranger i love the face of evil but that, anyway that's a story for another day uh the mind robber episode two i am choosing the forest of words i could have chosen anything around the new jamie uh, from concept to execution to performance to, you know, the the real story behind it. I, I could have chosen the toy soldiers. I could have chosen Evan Hercules' excellent design. I could have chosen the presence of Lemuel Gulliver uh, speaking the words uh, from from the book. All of that stuff. But I'm I'm going to narrow it down to the forest of words and let's see what David J Howe chooses. I bet it's something to do with Jamie's changing face, especially as he's. Fraser Hines is very good friend. So the second episode of Mind Robber, and the best thing about that is the fact that Jamie is not in it. Not because we miss him, it's just they've done it so well. Um, Fraser Hines um, got chicken pox on the day that they were meant to be recording. And so rather than use him, they came up with this great invention that he'd have his face changed and it would change in the episode, which is actually a stroke of genius. And it's probably the only story that they could have actually done that with, which is incredible. Uh, David is there in a lovely sort of Indiana Jones type of hat with a with a with a head torch and uh, is feeding the fire. He is uh, he is putting logs uh, on a wood burner in his house for, for anyone that wants to conjure the image there. Oh, and there's a there's a cat scratching pole behind him. Uh, so that's David in his home, dressed as a kind of sort of yeah. I mean, it, it could be his own kind of Doctor Who there, sort of Indiana Jones Doctor Who type. Um, I mean, if I'd played this game with any smarts, I would have, I would have 
chosen that because I had an inkling David was going to choose that, even though Fraser is one of his best friends and and it was a way of getting rid of Fraser. But he's right. All of the, I mean, he, he said basically all the things that I said about why the Jamie thing is so effective. But on this particular watch, I was drawn particularly to the Forest of Words. I went into this episode thinking I would choose Jamie and I went with my gut because um, I'm never going to win this. So I, I think one just has to try and be true to oneself. Um, I mean, I mean, it doesn't matter, does it? I haven't stumbled across some great truth there, have I? Uh, but I wanted to choose the forest words, so I did. Yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna puff it up any more than that. It's not some great principled stand. It's not some great philosophical viewpoint. I thought I would choose Jamie. I kind of knew uh, David would choose it, but I really wanted to talk about the forest of words, and I think it's brilliant. Uh, even though I think the Jamie thing is brilliant as well, and you know. Uh, a pretty smart uh, choice and a, and, and a deserving a, a thing that definitely deserves to be chosen. But um, you know, I've 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 never been one to give myself an easy win, which is why my life is a series of frustrations, and disasters, and underachievement. Even when there's an open goal, uh, I, uh, I I I sometimes I, I I somehow contrive to miss it. But there we go. Um, that's why I am always struggle with reality and are much, much happier in a land of fiction. Thank you so much for listening to Happy Times and Places, which is presented by me, Toby Haydock, and my special guest, David J. Howe, who you can find on Twitter at David J. Howe 1, just the digit. I'm grateful to David and, of course, to the many patrons who make these podcasts possible, and they include... Andy Case, Paul Carrington, Paul Carnahan, Alex Kafajoglu, Robbie C, Robin Bland, Gary Byrne, Rick Byatt, Will Brooks, David Bickley, James Bell, Luke Atkins, Kevin Ashelford, John Arnold, Kat Armitage, Andrew and Lisa, Peter Adamson, Risto Matti Sorillo, Gary Platt, Adam Parker, Graham Knott, Kevin Murdoch, Roland Moore, Nathan Martin, Philip Marsh, Ian K. McLachlan, Joe Llewellyn, Ian Key, Chris Hyam, Siobhan Galichon, Jason Gorman, Paul Dunn, Chris Dunford Kelk, John Deere, Grant Davidson, Richard Chalk, Paul Cook, Jenny at Blue Box 99, Nigel Bromley, and Tim Arding. The music is by Dave Gates, the artwork by Dylan Patterson. A big thank you to those patrons and to the others unnamed here who help to keep these podcasts going and uh, ensure that I spend proper time on doing them properly and ensure that I can you know, keep doing so on reasonable equipment and who keep these podcasts ad-free uh, because uh, I can think of nothing worse going, you know, the thing I really like about Hamish Wilson is also what I like about a clean shave. And I've never had a cleaner shave than with... Shavy giveaways, uh, Jim's razors, which you can get 25% off if you type in Toby Jim's uh, to, and all of that, um, partially because I don't shave. I do shave a little bit round the base of my neck if I want to be a little bit tidy, but uh, I don't really shave a razor last week. I've, I've got some shaving gel that has, has actually lasted me longer than quite serious relationships in my life. Uh, and it's still up there somewhere. I've, I've had a couple since, but um, that one is still there and it still works. I've got, yeah, I've got shaving gel that probably has uh, a, a mosquito in it that you could extract the DNA of a, di- of a dinosaur from. Anyway, uh, yes, these are ad-free because, well, they're always going to be ad-free, but uh, the, the, the Patreon system justifies my position of doing that because it means that I don't have to get uh, income from advertisers because i do it from voluntary patronage which you can do from three pounds a month at patreon.com forward slash toby haydoke uh there are bonus releases there are advanced releases there is exclusive material there are other little trinkets as well that lure you up the uh the financial ladder because uh three pounds a month is the lowest tier you get 10 percent off any tier if you sign up for a year in advance uh, and you get all of these podcasts much, much earlier if you are on the patron and you also get other bonuses. And if you're trying to imagine what David J. Howe looks like putting logs into his fire, I will I will put the videos on the Patreon as a kind of bonus. But there are other things as well, monthly AMAs, pictures of my dog. Um, and it's just the way that we do things nowadays. 
If you don't want to commit to a monthly subscription, and I completely get that, uh, you can do a one-off contribution at ko-fi.com forward slash Toby Haydoke if I've done something that you've particularly enjoyed or you're feeling particularly flush. There's no bonuses to that. You just get the satisfaction of having supported an independent creative artist or, the, or a man who just talks. Um, uh, but if you can do neither of the financial things, and I get that, we live in terrifyingly financially restrictive times so i am absolutely bowled over at anybody that is a patron or who has contributed on kofi and if you are amongst their number thank you so so very much i really am grateful and slightly baffled if i'm honest but uh, you do it so i keep going and uh, it's amazing what a world where you can you can have a, a th you know a, a, a particular little um it's not a peccadillo is it although it is night time and this is what I am up to. So maybe it is a peccadillo uh, that you can indulge in. And there's, there's enough people, good people, bless you, imaginative people, creative people. But I also do slightly doubt you. It's a bit like I've never I've always been slightly um, dubious about any woman that's ever fancied me because I do sort of or think that's, I, well, yeah, that's lovely. But what the hell is wrong with you? And I sort of feel that about all those list of names. People, people are lovely and I have lovely discourse with them. And I, but part of me does think, am, am I hoodwinking you or is, is there something wrong with you? Um, which is no way to be towards people who you are respectful of and grateful for. But there, I have to admit there's a little there's a little element anyway. So if you, so I can completely understand after that if you go, well, no, Sodja, I'm not going to become a patron and I'm not going to give you any Kofi cash. But what you can do that costs absolutely nothing is to go to iTunes, to go to Podbean, to go to all the outlets where you get these podcasts or where you can get these podcasts and give them a five star review. We live in a very binary world when it comes to appreciation of stuff. Um, anything lower than a five star review can be a sort of kicking, even if, uh, whereas a five star review really helps to uh, uh, tweak these algorithms to, to, to make sure the different listings and the different charts and all that sort of thing make these more uh, visible to passing trade. And uh, there's a lot of Doctor Who podcasts out there. There's a lot of podcasts out there full stop. So anything that increases the vis visibility. And also, you know, if you do like this stuff, it does my heart a little bit of good to see those uh, five-star reviews ping in and uh it, it, you know that, that, that's that slowed right up now that these podcasts are you know a, a few years in so if you haven't done that yet uh, a, a few five star reviews and and a few lines as well um you know saying what you like about these uh, gladdens my heart but also it really actually has a practical value because uh, it means it these get noticed out there and uh, you know the more it's noticed the more people listen the more people listen um the, the more it justifies the fact that um I've been doing this instead of, you know, several jobs around the house that need doing and actually some, you know, p proper work that might give me some kind of career because, because, you know, I'm a grown man and I'm, and I'm hawking for cash by talking about Doctor Who, which I'm not sure is very dignified, but I'm, as I say, I'm very glad you allow me to do it. So that's patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydoke, kofi.com forward slash Toby Haydoke, but as I say, if neither of those things are possible or desirable, reviews out there on cyberspace, lovely words on social media or on podcast providers really, really help. Thank you. I mentioned social media. I'm trying to get better at that. I'm uh, getting all fancy on Instagram where I'm at toby.haydoak, where there's... Uh, pictures of the dog but also some doctor who stuff goes up there uh but also i'm i'm you know doing videos of my comedy club excess malarkey which is something i've worked very hard on for the past 26 years and i'm very proud of a non-profit making comedy club that puts on the best acts for a, a, a very small fee don't let in stag do's hen do's or office parties it's about the comedy it's about the comedians doing their stuff that's every tuesday in manchester and that's excess malarkey which also has its own instagram feed at excess malarkey uh, which is also its Twitter handle. My Twitter handle is uh, at Toby Haydoak, whereas my Instagram is at Toby.Haydoak. But I'm fortunate that I've got such a ridiculous name. I'm fairly easy to find on either. These podcasts have their own feed 
at Hey Dope Podcasts on Twitter, and I have a Facebook page. I've got a personal one. I've got you know I'm I'm reached the limit of friends on that. So if we're if you're somebody who likes my work, I also have a, a you know a page which is where all my work stuff goes, and that's a better place to be. And I, I, it's on my list of things to do is to purge my my personal page because there's too many people on it and too many people I don't know who are either comedy you know comedian comedy people or doc two people it will still be me dealing with the page it's just i can have more people on it uh, and i can you know do that work-life balance thing that i've singularly failed to do ever and i say you know i'm working on doing that with the facebook page i've also got a skirting board upstairs that i haven't um uh painted in seven years uh i've got i've got a load of clothes to put away in the wardrobe i'll do that first i'll do that before i do the facebook page um we've got uh i mean there's there's so much sorting out stuff to do in the shed and the cupboard under the stairs and yeah so anyway the facebook thing is not a promise but um but go to the page rather than my my i can't befriend anyone else i can have um you know page followers i think you are and, and all my work stuff goes on that <laughs> I mean, they're amongst the shortest episodes of Doctor Who, but I still managed to string out this podcast into being 50 minutes. I don't know if that's good or bad. Do I need to get... Can you get more pithy? That's surely a contradiction in terms. Pithier. I need to get pithier. To, to be more pithy, to be pithier, is to actually be shorter. It's to be what I'm not being now. Um, or do we like the content? Do we like Do we like the non-secretors? I don't know. If you've listened this far, I mean, you've only got yourself to blame, really. I wonder what the algorithm is. Not the algorithm, but what the what the statistic is of people who actually stop watching, stop listening when the episode ends and who stick it out to the bitter end. Again, if you're doing that, I'm kind of grateful. It justifies my existence. You know, I blather, therefore I am. If nobody listens to this, you know, what, what actually is this? But I know there's at least a couple of you. But what are we doing? <laughs> I don't know. Um, and and as I say, I'm grateful. Of course, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to anybody. Is grateful to anybody for listening to the stuff that they do. But I also mistrust it. I, th- I mean, have you have you read Wuthering Heights? Do you know what I mean? Have you have you watched the Power Game? Have you learned how to make a baked Alaska? I would suggest they were all. You could actually learn to make a baked Alaska Alaska whilst listening to this. But I don't think you could do the other two things. So um, on the one hand, thanks. But on the other hand, what are you doing? Um, but also, you know, if if actually everybody stops listening to this bit, this therefore exists in its own sort of realm of unreality, which brings us back to, oh, it's very clever, isn't it? The mind rubber. <laughs>